honor for me to introduce the, uh, the last panel of the day, and a particular honor to be here at the traditional territory of the Chippewas of Rama. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit with a couple of the panelists before, before today about how it's not the last session, it is the last panel. So we feel like we kind of have a responsibility because a good, a co a lots of conferences and even really good conferences end and then they just, they're kind of over. And uh, we want to we want to try to maintain the momentum that I think uh, I feel and a lot of you feel. You know, it's like uh, it's hard to it's hard to break an 82 year old or 83 year old silence, and it's it takes a lot of work. It's like it's like building a a, a campfire from from nothing on cold ground. It takes a lot of energy and effort. At least, especially if you're like me and you know dang good at it. And then, and, then, and then you get it going, but you don't want it to just go out. You know, I don't want the conference to go out like an untended fire. I'll keep those embers hot, because then you can ignite it you know, all across the country. Uh, it occurs to me that maybe there's no time for metaphors, so uh, that'll be the last one, even if a really good one occurs to me. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is first give gifts to each of our speakers. The title of the panel is uh, Seven Generations in Passing on the Torch. And we've talked about seven generations in most of the, of the sessions uh, thus far, and rightly so. It's a central uh, principle that we try to be guided by. Uh, and it was, it was pointed out to me at the beginning of the conference by a very smart person that uh, for many families, the, the generation that's now rising that will begin to assume the mantle of leadership in the next five, 10, 15 years, is in fact the seventh generation post-Indian Act, the enactment of the Indian Act. And uh, it's not been an easy seven generations, that's perhaps a deliberate understatement. But at the end of it, here we are, and we're taking this seriously, I, I would suggest more seriously than we have uh, at any point <coughs> in the last seven generations and probably a while before that. So I think maybe that means something. I think, I think maybe that means this is an auspicious moment, at least it is if we make it so. But that's enough from me. Uh, I want to introduce, first of all, Leon Thompson, who's many important things, but for our purposes, none is more important than the fact that he's the co-chair of this very conference. <laughs> Indeed. He is uh, one of the suns around which we all orbit, and his light is reflected off all of us. Oh, that's a metaphor. Okay. Um, Go with yeah. It. Go also, with it. what's that? Go with it. Go with yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> We're just stones, but your light makes us stars. Okay, that is the last one. He's also a student leader. Um, uh, he's a student leader uh, at U of Saskatchewan. He was on the students' union from 2010 to 2012. On the Senate from 2011 to 2012. He's beginning legal studies at U of Saskatchewan. Uh, Leon's the first Aboriginal executive member of the Students' Union uh, in its more than a century of history. Uh, he's worked at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Ch Children's International Summer Village, it's Plains Cree, and uh, we owe much of what has occurred this weekend to him. So, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Hansé. Uh, bonjour. Uh, hello. My name is Leon Thompson. I'm the Kuchening Institute on Public Affairs 2013 co-chair. Uh, along with uh, Amanuel Mellis, uh, we have put together what I think has been a very informative conversation. Uh, I'd like to recognize that I'm speaking on the territory of the Chippewa of Rama First Nation. Um, I recognize the elders in the room and I thank them for coming and for uh, patiently listening to what can be a very young and uh, excitable uh, person. Um, I also recognize that I don't have to recognize, no, oh, I also recognize my privilege of not having to recognize my privilege as privilege. <laughs> and I'm just putting my political studies degree to good use because I really don't have anything else for it. Um, education is my life. It's all about what you can learn. And if you had told me that seven years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't believe anybody that says, you know, you're going to do really good stuff, you're going to go to post-secondary, you're going to want to do something outside of high school. 
because I didn't. But I truly believe that it's going to be the way that we can come together and light the eighth fire. A little bit of background on me.、Uh, when I went to high school,、um, elementary school, there wasn't Aboriginal content. There wasn't meaningful Aboriginal representation within the system, and so I grew up white. I mean, my God, listen to me. I don't have a res accent. I have spectacular vernacular. I've, <laughs> you know, I've got this. Advantage that a lot of Indigenous people don't have. I sound white, and it's because I grew up in the city. I went to an elementary school that taught about, you know, not necessarily just white stuff, but it didn't teach the Indigenous perspective. And so I thought, you know, this is interesting. It's not really reaching me to my core. I'm not really going to do anything past grade 12. It actually took me five years to get through grade、uh, for to,、uh, to get through、uh, high school because I'm not good at math. Um, and so I finished, and immediately I was like, "I'm out. I'm done. I don't have to do school anymore. I'm gonna go and work." And I moved to Vancouver, and I worked for four months, and I realized this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making ten fifty an hour. I'm sharing a one bedroom apartment. It's still way too much. I'm gonna move home and work. That's gonna be way better. And I thought I could just get a job, and you know. Keep busy. And I got a job working for a computer tech support company, and I was doing very well at it. And they said when I got hired, "Don't worry, you've got two, three years before you'll be making the top wage." And then I was being paid more than the top wage inside of seven months. And I realized I don't want to do this. This sucks. <laughs> and I thought, well, there's only one other thing. And so I applied to university, and luckily I was accepted under the, a transition program that helps、uh, students with low grades take enough classes so that they can be considered full time、uh, while learning to read at a university、uh, level and a university speed, and to write and to research. And it was because of that that all of a sudden I got interested. I thought, hey, this is pretty cool. This is pretty interesting. Oh, look at that! I'm learning about a little bit about indigenous cultures. You know, it's still native studies, and it's not perfect, but it expanded my mind. And now here I am, six years later. I've got a degree in political studies. I'm about to go into the College of Law.、Uh, I've done the program of legal studies for native people twice、um, because I'm not very good at passing things the first time. <laughs> but a mistake is a wonderful opportunity to learn. It is. A brilliant chance to, all at the same time, look back, right in front of you, and to the future, and you can say, "What happened? What did I do? How can I learn from it?" And so, I really believe education is the key, and to get people who are,、uh, to get young kids involved, to get young kids excited about not only just learning but being.、Um, And teaching them that it's not about guilt; it's about opportunity. It's about walking together.、Um, and if I could just do that for a moment, so we've had Judah、uh, all weekend being fantastic and asking thought-provoking questions. But I have seen him go deeper than that. I have seen him、uh, do more for this conference just without even thinking. He is in here several times. He's been in here this weekend cleaning up the paper cups that we leave behind. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. Like to have that kind of forethought. Like, what can I do for these people who were, who were just were talking with one another? And so, thank you very much, Judah. I appreciate it. And I really hope that you stay just as enthusiastic as you are, because if you do, you will be able to do. Anything you want, and I really hope that's education,、um, because it's a means to success in the modern world. Let's let's face it. It's not that if it's not as if we're going to educate everybody and then we're going to go back to traditional systems of living, and just break everything down. No, everyone's here. Everyone's here to stay. It's not that we can't live together. It's we have to figure out how to live together.、Um, It's important for Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, to access education because we haven't had it for 
you know, very long. And now we do. And we're seeing a fundamental shift in the way that we are uh, perceived as a group in Canada. We have gone from, you know, having the lazy Indian stereotype put, uh, placed onto everybody to seeing young people rising up and organizing, coming up with uh, completely different forms of media, of uh, art, of uh, language, of identity, which has been extremely prevalent, uh, as we've all seen here in the sessions. Um, it's a transformative opportunity that I think is too great to squander. And in terms of identity, it's going to be interesting to see how we do that. I have both a spirit name and a Twitter handle. And both of them connect me and identify me in a world that I can't touch, in a world that is intangible, but yet is so close to me and to my community that there's got to be a way, there has to be a way to live together with it. I mean, it doesn't mean that we have to give up the digital, and it doesn't mean that we have to give up the traditional. It's just finding out how we can mix the two and blend them into one. I mean, we're, we're already in a catamaran. We can't try and just separate ourselves or deny that we're moving forward and try and keep our, uh, keep our traditions and cultures in, you know, in a static state. Our cultures, our identities are continuously evolving and it's important to know that and to know where we're going as a people, uh, as a species. It's not just indigenous people. To light the eighth fire, we need everybody. Absolutely everybody. And so where do we go from here? If we need everybody, what can we do? And I've heard this question asked a lot. Like, you know, so what can we do to help, to walk with you? And I think it's pretty simple, it, but it depends on where you are in, your, in the stage of your walk. If you're a youth, get educated. Go to school, go to, go to a trade. Not necessarily even put yourself in those uh, post-secondary institutions of learning, but go and learn. Go and do something you know, that's unique, that hasn't been tried yet. If you're a parent, help them. Enable them, allow them to feel the creative wonder that stems from just being alive from seeing something and having a thought and going, oh, I wonder about... You can finish a sentence with anything. If you're an elder, teach. Teach us those old stories. Teach us that loving, hopeful, uh, truthful feeling. Make us... Give us a good grounding. Make us think. Um, teach about the issues, the problems, what you think the solutions are. Because nobody has it absolutely right, and even I have a few things that people would disagree with. But uh, it's, it's about that plurality of voices. It's about getting multiple ideas out there and the exchange of information to formulate that new idea that is just waiting in all of us. And sometimes the solutions are just talking, because just talking is the first thing we can do, and it's the simplest thing we can do. Um, I, I've been asked a lot of questions on identity, and I, I honestly, I, last night <laughs> uh, speaks to like the, the plurality of the voices, and I don't have, uh, I don't have one uh, consideration, like I don't have one just piece of identity that I can pull from that night and, you know, reference, because it was all so awesome, and I kind of want to, you know, take it all and incorporate it and make my, I don't know, my, make my identity slightly more uh, patchwork, slightly prettier. Um, and it's making sure that there are others who understand your identity. It's, like, some of the questions I've gotten, oh my god. Um, I actually had a, a woman tell me, you were the first Indian I've ever met. Thank you very much for answering my questions. And that was in Ottawa <laughs> a year ago. It's not that we know, it's not that they know either, 
we all have these questions, and some of us are super uncomfortable about asking, like, you know, why do you wear your hair in a long, in a long braid? Or, uh, you know, why do you smudge, and why do you pray when you have a cigarette? It's, it's those kind of questions. It's that kind of talking. It'll give you at least a leg up or that desire to learn, that desire to find more, um, that desire to go out and know. And uh, there, there's, just, there's two re really important things that I want to make, uh, make sure I talk about. First off, there is something that we do have to do as pr a progressive society, as a progressive people, and that is, and this might sound a little bit counterintuitive, but be nicer to government. And I don't mean making, you know, saying, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll take these undefined rights for these defined rights and lose a bunch. Behind a member of parliament, behind a bureaucrat, in which I got to know many, I got a brilliant opportunity to work at Foreign Affairs for a summer uh, on Aboriginal issues within the department. I met so many cool bureaucrats, and they want to do such good stuff. But they are... Uh, they provide fearless advice and faithful obedience to the government. And it's not that they don't want to do things, but they are at the will of the political masters. But I hear them say, it's frustrating. Because we never hear about the successes, the well-written policy, the Kelowna Accords that have been thoughtfully uh, crafted by more than one side. And even members of parliament, too, you know, they're trying their very hardest to get what they believe is absolutely right. And it's not all perfect. We are measuring success in completely divergent manners. They see a beautifully written policy that's going up for debate, and they think, that's a success. You know, we're doing this country right. And for a lot of us, I think we see success as, oh, they didn't enact that policy. That's, that's an absolute failure. It's still discussion. It's still talking. It's still bringing the ideas out and encouraging uh, good ones. And I think that it's that interaction, that, uh, that kindness to one another, that love, that, that optimistic sense of we can do something, you know? Um, you catch more headdresses with honey. Uh, I say that because I had the brilliant opportunity before I came here to go to the Oshiega Performing Music Festival in Montreal. And I saw brilliant bands, and I saw a tribe called Red, uh, and I also saw a lot of headdresses. And I saw a lot of t-shirts that had uh, headdresses on them being worn by skulls. And that kind of stuff, if unquestioned or undiscussed, will relegate indigenous people to being considered a dead people. And, and so I saw, I saw one headdress when I walked into Oshiega and I thought, okay, you know, I'm gonna go talk to him. I'm like, hey man, that's offensive. And uh, he just kind of looked at me and was like, okay, why? And I tried to explain it. And, but I had opened it up in, uh, in a conflictory manner. I had opened it up with not anger, but, you know, I wasn't happy. And I said, that's offensive. Oh, and well, there was counter-argument back and forth and back and forth, and eventually he just left. And we didn't get anything. Like, done. And so I thought, okay, that didn't really work. What can I do? Maybe I'll be nicer. Maybe I'll be really nice. I'll be offensively nice. <laughs> 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 And just as I was thinking that, I saw a group of four tall, white-ish dudes walking <laughs> through the, the crowd, and they all had giant headdresses on, and I thought, there. And I walked over to them and I said, hey, can I talk to you guys for a minute? And I instantly, I saw one guy look at me and go, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay. I said, so have you heard about the controversy with wearing uh, tra traditional indigenous headdresses at a music festival. And they said, no. <laughs> oh, well, let me tell you about it. You know, in indigenous culture, the headdress is considered sacred. It is, it is spiritual regalia. It has a spirit just as you do. And 
it's kind of akin to walking around wearing the Pope's hat. You know, it may not mean something spiritual to you, but it can mean a, the world to somebody else. Oh, okay. Hmm. <laughs> well, you know, we didn't really wear this because we thought that we were honoring you. And I thought, okay, that's, that's great. You know, that's, <laughs> that's perfect. So why were you wearing it? And they said, well, there's like 40,000 people here. We just wanted to find each other. <laughs> No malice behind their, in, like, no, no <laughs> ill intent. They just wanted to be able to find their friends, and you've got a foot of feathers up here. That's pretty good. <laughs> and so I said, okay, I get that. Maybe next time wear a top hat. <laughs> or something else. And the conversation was really good. And what I told them was, it's not that you... You know, it's not your fault you didn't know. But now, it's your responsibility to know. And to take what this, whatever this interaction is, go, go home, Google it. Like, take a look at headdresses on Wikipedia. Take a look at indigenous regalia. There are pages upon pages upon pages out there. You can know. And they said, thank you, and we chatted a bit, and we said, who are you here to see? And, Oh, we're here to see this band and that band and Mumford and Sons, obviously. And, <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, cool. So who are you here to see? A Tribe Called Red. Just don't go with those on. <laughs> <laughs> they, they will not let you hear the end of it. And I realized as I was walking away that that interaction had been wholly enriching for everybody because I had learned how to approach uh, somebody who was wearing a sacred regalia, and to connect with them. And that was the best part. We actually had a connection. And the next day, I was walking up the hill, trying to get a really good seat. Um, and I saw those four dudes. And they were wearing tie-dye t-shirts and headbands. And they could see each other in the crowd. And they recognized me, I'm like, hey man, we checked that stuff out. It's cool. <laughs> like, like, we didn't know about it, but it's really interesting. Did you know Montreal's on Indian land? <laughs> <laughs> it is all about engaging with one another. <laughs> engaging, educating, and laughing. And I think... You will catch more headdresses with honey. We've had, unfortunately, tense relations for the last 500 years. But now we have this grand access to education through the internet. And to use the new tools and blend them with the old, I think is an identity that goes far deeper than indigenous peoples. I think it goes to human people. Because it is a two-way road. And what we teach you, we will happily be taught in return. So what can you do? Google it. <laughs> Check out Twitter. Check out that hashtag, Fire. Read it, retweet it, get into conversations, get into friendly arguments. Take what's available and put it to the best use. And then everyone will have a chance to learn. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. And a I'd like to introduce Heather Watts next. Heather is an educator and an education innovator. She just finished her Master's of Education from Columbia University about two weeks ago. And uh, she has been uh, widely recognized for her scholastic achievements. This coming year she'll be teaching a third grade class in Brooklyn. And uh, she wants to work in reforming indigenous education, opening up curriculum and pedagogy. And Heather is uh, Mohawk from the beautiful Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Yep. Thank you.
Sego Seo Guego, Heather Ne Jungyat, Ganyege Haga Nii, Waskulewage. Hello, everyone. As was said, my name is Heather Watts. Uh, I come from the Mohawk Nation, and I'm Bear Clan. And I'd like to start how um, others before me have started and recognizing the people of um, Mijiganing whose territory um, we've been fortunate enough to gather on the past few days. Um, it's always a, a real pleasure to come to this area. My family and I used to come to um, the powwow every year, and it's always really nice, and you have a good feeling when you're here, so thank you. And I'd also like to take the time to thank the organizers for having selected me to speak on this panel. Um, it's, an, it's really a, truly an honor um, to be a part of a set of speakers <coughs> Um, who are so accomplished and so many leaders that I've looked up to since, you know, I was a young girl. So I'm going to start by saying that I've learned a lot um, over the, fast, the past few days. My mom will tell you that after the first day, I was like, my brain hurts. Like, I was really just filled and thinking, and, um, but it was a good brain hurt. And over the past few days, I've been, you know, writing down quotes that I should try and incorporate and change the direction of my speech at least a dozen times. So I think I've, I've got it um, the way I want it to go now. So just to start off, talking a little bit about myself. <clears throat> I'm a rookie educator um, from Six Nations Reserve. I've been living in the United States for the past five years, having completed my um, bachelor's degree at Syracuse University and now living in New York City. And I want to set the context for what I want to speak with you about today by telling you um, a personal story. Um, so this past spring, as a part of our program, we have to go on um, teaching internships. And I was a part of a second grade internship at a school in the South Bronx, um, whose school district is the poorest congressional district in the entire country. And so most of these students come from you know, broken homes, 98 to 99 percent of them um, come to school and receive free or reduced price lunches and most of them are Hispanic or have African-American background. So we had reached a unit where we were learning about the Lenape and the Lenape are the traditional peoples of the island of Manhattan or as they call it Manhattan. I was asked to take on a session of teaching um, about Lenape, not only to our class, but the entire second grade, um, and to share kind of a perspective of what lives on reservations are like today. So of course, you know, I email home, I'm like, oh, I need pictures, I need videos. So I include, you know, videos of myself and my nephews at powwows, dancing, you know, in our full regalia, my nephews playing lacrosse, pictures of the buildings on my reservation, my school, um, what my house looks like, the fact that, yeah, we have a fire um, station and an ambulance and a police station. And the kids were astounded. One, they couldn't believe that I was Native American and that I still existed today. And that was something, um, at first, it was kind of cute. Um, but then when I went home and kind of reflected on what that really meant, it was really sad. Um, one girl, of course, was a little bit confused because I, I was I'm talking about the Lenape. I'm trying to like, show pictures of back then, and then I'm forwarding, fast forwarding to what life looked like on my reserve. And I'm not Lenape, but of course to them I was Lenape, so I was like, I'll, just, I'll let that go. You think I'm alive now, so I'll just, <laughs> I'll just let that go. You can think I'm Lenape. Um, and one girl was a little confused because um, she thought I existed um, you know, back in the 1400s. Um, <laughs> So I go home and I, I'm really shocked to learn of how little they actually know of the area that they live in. And that everything that I know, whether I label myself as an educator, as a student, as a Canadian, as an American, that however I label myself, being Mohawk and being Ojibwe are always intertwined and at the core of my being. And the fact that Everything I know about myself and my core did not exist to these children was striking. And it's really, it's upsetting, I, I can't think of a better word to say it, um, 
when you encounter someone who thinks that your people and your culture that you know is so strong and so beautiful does not exist. So, I'll come back to that. I'm going to rewind for a second and talk to you about the moment when I actually realized that I was Indian and that I was Aboriginal, that I was Mohawk. And it was at my first powwow. And like, this is nothing, you know, on my parents. It's not like they hid it from me until we went to my first powwow or anything. It's just, you know, like we would go to ceremony and things like that. But it was something I thought everybody did. I didn't think, oh, I do this because I'm Mohawk. I just thought, I thought everyone did it. Um, so at my first powwow, when I was introduced um, into the circle of dancing, um, it felt good and it felt right. And... Um, a majority of my schooling has taken place off reserve with non-Aboriginal students. You know, and I've experienced things from people thinking that it's weird that I'm Native, for people thinking, um, why don't you go to school on the reserve? Why are you going to school here? Or having teachers ask me for the Native perspective on issues, as if I'm supposed to carry every Aboriginal person in Canada on my back and, um, and answer questions. I've gone to a Catholic high school where I was questioned for wanting to run for student government because I was not Catholic. I've been at Syracuse University, the area that is the homeland of the Haudenosaunee people, and this is where it was really put into perspective for me, how little people know about existence, about issues, about struggles, and how they all stem from history. So we've heard a lot um, even this morning and the past few days about the two-row wampum belt. So I don't need to go into detail explaining what that is. But I will talk a little bit about what I'm referring to as my inner two-row dilemma. And for me, since I've, you know, primary like, amount of my schooling has been with people who are non-Aboriginal, I've always felt like I need to stay in one vessel and act a certain way when I'm with those people, say a certain thing. And then when you know, I want to jump ship and head back to the canoe, it's a lot more comfortable, and I act a certain way and speak a certain way then. But what I've been learning about, and it's been a personal struggle for me, is that you don't have to be one or the other. That the two worlds collide all the time, and maybe there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe sometimes we're looking out for the best interests of one another. Maybe sometimes that does get in the way, but maybe sometimes it's well-intentioned. I've, you know, gone back and forth um, with this struggle. Should I go back to Six Nations and teach? Or should I, you know, stay in New York City, a place that I've grown to love, where I'm fulfilling my dream and I know I'm being a role model for another kid who wants to do maybe something similar to me? It's been a real personal struggle for me. So thinking back to those kids that thought I was weird, that asked why didn't I go to school on the res, that discriminated against me because I wasn't Catholic. All of those peers were once little students, sitting in the same desks that my third graders will be sitting in in September. They were little students who had teachers, and these teachers made conscious decisions of what to include in the curriculum and what not to include. You were once all those little students. You all had teachers who decided what was important or what was not important to teach you. Now, isn't that such a big decision and such a big responsibility? What is important to teach someone what they should know about their world and what maybe we can push to the side. Deciding what's important and what's vital for a child to know is such a big responsibility. And we send children very strong messages at little, at young ages about what's important and what's not in this world. So to go back to the story about the young student Katie who thought I existed in the 1400s. We went on a field trip to what is known as the Van Cortland House, and we had moved on to talking about when the Dutch had come to New York, and New York was becoming New Amsterdam. And 
we had gone through the house, and there's a man leading us who's dressed all in his, you know, colonist gear. And this girl, Katie, asks the question, um, why did you kick Miss Watts and her family out of New York? <laughs> She has been gone for a long time and just came back this year. <laughs> so, <laughs> immediately, you know, all the teachers in the room all kind of looked to me. We're all kind of giggling a little bit. But the kids, the kids are looking to this man <laughs> for an answer. And, and this guy that's probably, you know, he's wearing a costume, probably not of Dutch ancestry whatsoever. He's just working for the museum. <laughs> it's kind of like, oh my gosh, like, I have to answer this question. Um, and he kind of was just like, oh, maybe that's something more for your teachers to talk about. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just portraying um, one of the columnists from that time. Um, and later on, Katie took such an interest in the Lenape we would move on to other points in history, such as talking about the Industrial Revolution. And she would raise her hand and be like, did the Lenape kids have to work in those factories too, getting paid nothing? And she always wanted to know what the Lenape had to do um, with at the time period. So in her own way, Katie was an activist for the Lenape that day. This little second grader believed wholeheartedly that this was the man that she needed to question about the mistreatment of these people. And she wanted answers. And she inspired her peers to want answers as well. She felt it was wrong, and she wanted him to know that she felt it was wrong. This is why I have chosen to become a teacher. A teacher of Native ancestry that teaches non-Native children. If I can teach as many non-Aboriginal children as I can, and first make them aware that we exist, that we are strong, that we have a history, and importantly, that we have a history in the making, then I will have fulfilled my purpose. We could use a lot more Katie's in this world, people who are conscious about the world around them, who question the status quo, and who will fight for what's right, regardless of race, ethnicity, or whatever other kind of difference you want to categorize people with. My challenge for all of you is to be a Katie in your own world, whatever that means for you. Don't let the flame that has been ignited in you all, and I know I can see it and I could hear it in all the conversations during lunch and all of the other meals. Don't let that fizzle out. Whether that means sitting down with your children and learning with them, or going back and having this conversation with people in your own communities. Be a Katie. Be a leader. Be an activist. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. <laughs> I'm going to call up Michael Redhead Champagne next. Michael is a community organizer, community leader. He's of the, Sh <laughs> He's of the Shem <laughs> Shemattawa First Nation, Shemattawa Cree, but, of, uh, but raised in North Winnipeg, uh, and he's become a champion for North Winnipeg, I think it's fair to say. The details are in the bio, but uh, in 2008 he created the Arrows Youth Engagement Strategy. 2010 he founded AYO, Aboriginal Youth Opportunities. And, uh, and since 2011, he's been the driving force behind the uh, weekly Meet Me at the Bell Tower anti-racism rallies. He's also anti-violence anti rallies, right? <laughs> he also um, co-hosts a weekly talk radio uh, program called Inner City Voices. It's pretty much a force of nature. Thank you. <laughs> I'm grateful for an opportunity to acknowledge the four directions, the four parts of who I am, and the four parts of who each of us are. I acknowledge the traditional territory 
of the Chippewas of Rama, upon which we all so graciously are conversing today. I say thank you to these, these courageous panelists. Leon, it's your fault that I'm here. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Who knew? Um, Heather. Katie. Yes. <laughs> and, and you will know very soon about Wes. Um, I also want to say thank you for this tobacco and this medicine because as was articulated by some of my relatives, I am the land. I am the land. And when I hold this tobacco, I feel grounded and I feel strong. And I feel ready, because this is not easy. Like many young people, at birth, I was taken from my family, put into the care of the government. It provided a rocky start for things. But I was lucky. There was a family in the north end of Winnipeg that kept me. They fostered 300 children through Manitoba CFS system, and I was number 301. And I must have done something right, because they let me stay with their family, and they let me call them mom and dad. And I finally knew what it was to have brothers and sisters. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, and I finally knew what it was to feel like I belonged. So growing up, I was constantly asking myself a lot of those questions. Who am I? And I have such love for my Champagne family. I love you. It's the same love that I have for each of you as my relatives. But it's the same love that I have for this tobacco. And they raised me into this person that I am today. But there was one thing that I didn't know that I didn't have. I didn't have a sense of my identity as an indigenous person. And it was extremely difficult to uh, come to grips with that at the age of 18 when I first learned about Indian residential schools after graduating from high school understanding that my mother went to Indian residential schools and her inability to take care of me and my siblings was not her fault. The anger, not only towards her, but towards those who put this system in place, still makes it difficult for me to say the word reconciliation. Because I don't know if that's possible. I'm still mad. But at the age of 18, I began to learn who I was for real. In the north end of Winnipeg, we have one of the highest Aboriginal populations in Canada. And as you would expect, along with that come a lot of the negative things that we've been talking about all weekend. I don't want to talk about those things. That's not going to be a part of our story for much longer. Instead, I would like to share with you that this journey that has been taken for me as an individual in the last eight years has absolutely transformed my life. And something that I didn't know was missing has been filled. A connection that I didn't know I was longing for <coughs> connected. And it answered that question of identity that so many of us are looking for. 
indigenous, non-indigenous, we are all trying to answer that same question. Who am I? What is my identity? Every single one of you was motivated to come to the Kuchichin Conference this year to answer that very question. Because as human beings and as people, I, I think of this, navigating the relationship between indigenous indigenous peoples and Canada. I think of indigenous people and Canadian people. And I think it sets it up um, in a world of pluralities. And we've talked enough about the differences and we've talked enough about the problems that I want to talk about the common thread that unites every single one of us that is sitting in this room right now. And it is that search for who we are and our identity. All we want is to walk with integrity so that the things that we say match the things that we do. Your actions match your beliefs. That's integrity. That's all we're trying to do. And I, with love and gratitude, sincerely thank all of you for joining us on this very important conversation. And so that thread that unites all of us reminds me of some of the challenges that we faced. So at the age of 18, I began to be a tutor. Education seems to be a bit of a theme. I, be, I was a tutor. I was hired by an Aboriginal nonprofit organization to help kids with their homework. It was great. I love helping kids with their homework. It was in my own neighborhood, and it enabled me the opportunity to pay for my own university so I could get educated as well. And now in post-secondary, I'm taking it extremely slow, but I will be an qualified educator by post-secondary standards. I'm about two-thirds of the way through my first degree, and the other one's right behind it. <laughs> but I think about, I look at myself more as a street educator. Not not, I don't ever see myself standing in front of a classroom and talking to a group of 30 kids. I, I just, alternative education is my passion. Because, as was mentioned earlier, we never stop learning. Never. We never stop learning. And so after four years of working with these beautiful, strong, resilient, young, indigenous people, I realized a few things. They, they taught me about youth engagement. And if you look at the demographics of our population in the indigenous community, youth engagement has never been more critical of an issue than it is today. With sometimes 50, 60 percent of our populations in some communities being under the age of 25, we need to start looking at our young people and asking ourselves the question, how are we going to engage them in this conversation and in this process and in creating the solution because that solution is the one that they're going to have to deal with. And if we are to walk with integrity together, we must enable these young people to help us come up with their own solutions. And so after four years of working within this established Aboriginal nonprofit agency, I quit. Because it felt to me like inside of those institutions, even if they're there to help us specifically, you can't breathe. You can't breathe because you put forward a suggestion that the young people came up with themselves and, oh no, the funders don't want us to do that, so we're not going to do it. The management team has decided that we're going to hold on to that idea for a little bit and you guys go on about your way and don't worry, you'll never hear from us again. I quit but I could not walk away from those kids that taught me so much about youth engagement and about relationships. Because when you know their name, when you know what they like, when you know what their gift is, it changes you. <clears throat> it absolutely changes you. And these young people that too often the rest of the world look at and say, oh, you poor, poor, the plight of these poor children. I think that is very incorrect. Because when I look at these children, they are strong, they are resilient, they're creative, and they're hungry to participate in the solutions that they know are going to affect them. But why? 
because these children are sick of watching their brothers and sisters die on the street or end their own lives by suicide. In 2010, one year, less than one year, it was about six months after I left that job, I gathered these young people together at the Circle of Life Thunderbird House in Winnipeg. And I said, hey, come to, come to uh, Thunderbird House. I have some Aboriginal youth opportunities for you. Two volunteer opportunities, one paid employment, and one that I made up. <laughs> they came. We sat in a circle. And at the end of it, I had to tell them the truth. I didn't bring you here because I wanted you to have opportunities, per se. I brought you here because I missed you. And they wanted us to be together again. And there's something about being together with a group of people who share your struggle that makes you feel like you're not alone anymore. And I knew that that was the solution. I knew that that was the solution. And so I said, what do we do? Please, what do we do next? And they said, well, let's make this a group. Aboriginal Youth Opportunities. Ayo! <laughs> Seriously, try it. Ayo! Ayo! Very good. See, it's fun. So we became a group. And the first thing that we needed to do as a group was that we needed to decide what the heck we were doing. So let me share with you the innovation of our young people when they are empowered to do something, not because they are transcribed by funders, programs, or anything else to do it, but because of the relationships and the love that they have for one another and the courage that they have to face the things that are difficult. And these young people came up with a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful model that I want to share with you. And it's called shit. <laughs> I wish I was kidding. <laughs> Stereotypes. AO exists to address the stereotypes that are constantly being perpetuated of young indigenous people. And so the first people we went after were the media, radio, TV. We went to the media and we made that relationship with them. So now, three years down the line, when there's an issue facing Aboriginal youth, they don't go to the executive director of this organization or that organization, they go right to the young people themselves and they have their own voices heard. That's breaking stereotypes. <laughs> But we, can, but we cannot break those stereotypes without the H that we need to address, which is hypocrisy. And one of the criticisms that these young people have said is that in the, in the education system, or, or, or often in the, in the justice system, they feel like there's this overwhelming amount of hypocrisy. Yo, no one's allowed on their cell phone. Hello? Oh, it's okay. I'm a staff. That is not integrity. That's hypocrisy, and that is what we wanted to address. And the I, institutions. If, if we find a solution that works for us, that's fantastic. But we're only two people. And so we push the young people to take that solution that works on a micro level and bring it to the macro. We're not interested in incremental change, are we, Arthur? Institutional change. That's where we're going. But how? Well, that's the T. Teachings. The tobacco. Remembering that we are of the land and that connection that we have with our spirits. Listening with our minds, our hearts, our bodies, and our spirits. These teachings will guide us like a compass in the right direction when we're lost or when we're scared. Shit. <laughs> Stereotypes, hypocrisies, institution, and teachings. That's why AO exists. And it's simple. And I apologize, but if the word shit offends you, you're really not going to want to hear any of the other things we have to say. <laughs> <laughs> 2011, Winnipeg was the murder capital of Canada. The first and last murders of that year happened on Selkirk Avenue, a street that I've lived on and where I work and continue to work to this day. Young people, perpetuating violence against young people, why? Over a color? So they 
can feel like they belong somewhere is what they're looking for. They just needed to feel like they had a gift. And if they can't find it at home because our families are fractured, if they can't find it in school because our teachers have decided that their identity isn't important enough to bring into the classroom and their history, all of our history, these young people are amazing. But we had enough. After losing too many of our young people, our people who are close to us, to violence, to suicide, we said, that's it. November 2011, we stood up and we said, we are going to stop the violence. Now, that's a tall order if you look at the history of Winnipeg. We, but, but here's the thing about education, and, and I'm confident that my colleagues up here would agree, setting high expectations for our kids shows them that we believe that they can achieve that. We have to set the standard high. We are going to stop the violence. And guess what? We met that Friday, and we thought only the five of us were going to be there, because guess what? Storm, north part of Winnipeg only, minus 40, snow. Great. <laughs> so we contemplated canceling the rally, but we didn't. We said, do you know what? Even if only the five of us show up, that's five more people rallying together to stop violence than there were yesterday. And we were so lucky because 40 people came. And then we asked, when do we do this again? Do we wait for another death before we come together as a community and reaffirm that we have to be the change and lead with our example to show our brothers, our sisters, our relatives, our neighbors that they can live violence-free? Well, they said, next Friday. And the next Friday. And the next Friday. And here we are in August of 2013 and we still rally every single Friday. But we wonder sometimes, is getting together and ringing a bell with a bunch of little kids and community members really going to solve the violence? Well, let me tell you some statistics, because in Winnipeg, 2012, they began measuring. They began measuring violent crime in Winnipeg. And over 2012, it went down by about 3% in the whole city, which is fantastic. In the north end of Winnipeg, where there are about 60,000 people, it went down even more, about 7%. But they also did an additional measurement in two blocks in every direction around our bell tower. 18% reduction in violent crime on Selkirk Avenue in the north end of Winnipeg by bringing our children together. And it all came because these young people had the courage to aim high. They had the courage to share their gift. And in one another, they, they set the example. That 10-year-old girl from Island Lake, a community in Manitoba that have been flooded for the last two years. And in the last two years since those communities have been flooded, the province and the federal government have been pointing fingers here, there, and everywhere, deciding who's going to pay the bill. And guess what didn't make the headlines? that 16 of those young people have committed suicide in the last two years. But you know it now, and you can't unknow it. And we must do this together. Please, help us break shit. Help us empower our young people to create their own solutions. And sometimes we have to get that bureaucracy out of the way so that our young people can come up with genius things. And now we have all of these people in my neighborhood who I am so honored to work with, who, who know their identity. And they walk with their head up high because they have integrity. And they know they have a gift that the world desperately needs right now. It's called leadership. They have it. And they're using it. And like our culture and our traditional ways, it is not supposed to be put behind some type of a glass cabinet and admired from afar. Our culture has power when we live it, when we share it, our culture has power 
to change ourselves the same way that my own awakening has changed me. And in only eight short years, here I stand with a handful of tobacco on stage with these change makers. And I just hope that the kids from my neighborhood are watching. I hope the kids from other isolated communities are watching. Because guess what? We're the same. And you can be on this stage too, sharing your experiences, educating the educators on how to work with young people. You can do it. But don't forget the teachings along the way. They will ground you. The last thing that I wanted to do, even though I'm only learning, and I know I'm probably running out of time, I don't know, there's nobody flagging me down, so. Um, this is, um, I talked about I wanted, how I wanted to focus on what connects us. And something that is really important is, like I said, to make sure that we share our culture. Because putting it away, safely protected behind a bag, is not as effective as role modeling it to you. And I know exactly one song on the hand drum. And I learned it in the last six months. But I want to share it with you. And I don't only want to share it with you. I want to share it with the land. Because I just wanted to address one of the things that I think was really important from a previous panel. And it was from the Idle No More and Defenders of the Land panel about why do young people get involved with Idle No More? Because those international agreements and those national agreements are absolutely integral for all of us to understand. However, when I ask young people why they get involved in Idle No More, they say it's because they want to do something finally to stand up for our women. Because they are beautiful and they deserve it. And the way that our women are being treated is the same way that Mother Earth is being treated. And it is not acceptable, and our children know this. Are you listening? Are we listening? This drum is the heartbeat of Mother Earth. I will never forget. Yo, chihuahua, be my tenition, I bet. 
Thank you very much, Michael. And it's uh, not an easy act to follow, but I have no doubt that uh, the personnel call up will be, is more, more than up to the task. It's a really tremendous honor for me to introduce Wes Fine Day. Um, Wes works in a whole range of creative mediums as a writer and also as a visual artist. But he's also a storyteller of the highest order, and he's been recognized for his ability uh, to deliver those heal healing stories at festivals across the country and elsewhere. He's also a traditional knowledge keeper and an arts consultant, often featured in the media. And he's Plains Cree of the Sweetgrass First Nation, so please welcome Wes Fine Day. <clears throat> This will not take long. <laughs> I really need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but I want to say thank you to the organizers. I want to say thank you to the community on whose land we stand and whose land we have spent the last few days. But first of all, First of all, I want to say I thank Creator for this opportunity. And I thank the spirits that work for Creator. Today, I sat by the water and I offered tobacco to the sacred fire and I asked the spirits that inhabit this part of the land to come and to stand with us, to help us by enlightening our minds, lighting up our hearts, our pathways, our homes, so that in this attempt to begin to elevate the level of the dialogue that we have been having from scrapping and arguing to try to bring to the circle the highest level of who we were dreamed to become. There is a process involved in this. This will not happen because we wish it were so. And the way to find out how this process works, curiosity is not the key. There is a system and there are protocols in place. This is not something that can be taken. It is not something that can be assumed. And it is not something that can be stolen. It is something that must be earned. The way of the warrior is not a path for the faint-hearted or the feeble-minded. We must leave the things that we came with when we were children and we moved from the world of the child into the world of the young adult. We were no longer children. 
and we must leave childish behavior, childish thinking behind. And that is why those rites of passage exist. With those rites of passage come teachings. And whose job is it to pass on those teachings? This is the work of the traditional knowledge keepers. And I have been to many communities, not only across Canada, but around the world. And I have met with many traditional knowledge keepers and medicine people. And they say, help us. Help us to reclaim our place in the community. Help us repair the social fabric that has been damaged. Help us to become the elders we need to become. We are wounded, we are injured, and we have nothing to pass on. And so I began working with the elders to help understand how the process of moving from birth and even before birth when as a spirit being you stood before Creator and Creator said, I will give you an opportunity to move into the physical dimension and to walk a physical walk with a physical body. There are laws. This physical body that you have been blessed with is the home of your soul and your soul is sacred. You must respect it. You must treat it as if you understand its power, its holiness, and its sacredness. In your body needs to be nurtured. What comes from the earth? The ancestors before you, seven generations, prayed, did ceremony, they spoke words, they told stories, they sang songs. And the power, the spirit of those songs and stories went flying up into the rest of creation, came into contact with suns and moons and planets, asteroids, and it bounced back to the earth. And when it returned to the earth, the earth took them up, for they were sent with power, by powerful spirits who had good hearts, and who had a great dream for a bright future for our young people. And the earth took those energies and internalized them and took them to her core and then sent them back up. And from those prayers, from those dreams, from those ceremonies, the plants that you see, which are the medicines, which are the food of humanity, came. It was no accident. We have a place in this process. But if we have been injured, if we have been wounded, and the words that we speak, the ceremonies are tinged with anger, with hatred, with negativity, and we send that into the earth, into the cosmos, and it comes back the earth still takes it. The earth absorbs it. The earth takes it into her core and sends it back up. And when it reaches the surface, it manifests itself as tornadoes, as floods, as fires, as what we like to refer to as natural disasters. There is nothing natural about them. We are part of the process. We are the cause of this process. And for too long, we have, been, we have been mired in our negativity and dysfunctional behavior, in our alienation, having only our loneliness. And I heard a voice that said, in our loneliness, we are together, waiting for the day of the lone warrior. 
I traveled far away to a house upon an empty plain from where we stood and watched the comings and the goings on of all we knew. Was it a dream, I asked myself, or was this simply just a sign of things to come? My side is aching from a fear that I can hide no more. The spirits that come calling me are waiting in eternity. Another time, another place, but something else grabs onto me and brings me back to this reality. And in there, I dreamed of a message for all of us as human beings. Look within, not only the surface, but look deep within. Find the warrior within. Find the warrior who has understanding, who has knowledge, and who has the courage and conviction so that when they speak, their words ring with the passion of the truth that the words convey and carry and bring forth into this moment. Do not be afraid to speak of your dreams. Have the courage to tell the truth about our past. And I know that sometimes it is not an easy thing to speak of. But it is necessary in order to let it go. Not to forget it, but to learn from it. And to move into the new dreaming. The spirits came into my lodge and they told me, this is a time. They said, grandchild, do you remember when you were young and the old people spoke to you about the difficult times ahead? And I said, yes, I remember. And they said, grandson. You have arrived. There are changes coming, and they will happen in the blink of an eye. There is going to be a transformation in attitudes, in understanding. There is going to be a change. Young people will rise up. And I have seen the face of the future. I have seen the young people awakening. I have seen the young people arising. And those of the old school, I have heard them try to discount them saying, but they are leaderless. And I say to them, this is what democracy looks like. We are all leaders. We all have a voice. And we all have the responsibility and the opportunity to act upon our convictions, upon our understanding. You say, come to me with one voice. And you say, at the same time, you have yet to build the capacity to do that. And I say to you, listen with one. Listen to the one voice. If you cannot hear it, what this tells me is that you cannot hear it in the same way that when my children went to school and uh, when I got into discussions with uh, educators and they said, you young people are failing to make it in our systems. There must be something wrong with them. We have to get specialists to come in and do studies and determine what the problem is with your children. And I said to them, it's your methodology of teaching. It's your teaching staff. It's your institutions. Look at that first before you blame my children. There is nothing wrong with my children. They have no problems learning when I teach them. I have a stake in their future. I care about them. To me, 
I, they do not become visible at 9 o'clock and disappear at 3.30. I have been with them since the moment they arrived into this earth. And I hope that I am with them until they have developed the ability, the strength, the vision, the spiritual connections to be able to walk in a holy and sacred manner, guided by the spirits and walking under their own power. This is the dream I have dreamed. And I look around and I see my children and I am filled with joy and I am filled with pride. The dream is alive. And today we look for partnerships. You know, I have had people come, approach me, saying, we want to partner with you, but it was always because I had something they wanted. They wanted to be my partner. They were not interested in my future. And when I said, I too am looking for a partner, these are the things that I see that need to be rebuilt because they have been broken, but I need resources. I do not need advice. And they said to me, I can find it in my heart to support you, but I cannot find it in my pocket. And so, I again send out this request. Join us in this journey to improve the conditions for your children. Join us in this attempt to improve the conditions for my children. We talk about treaties, and my family is no stranger to treaty making. <coughs> Seven generations back, my ancestors were involved in making a treaty with the Blackfoot. Nineteen generations back, we also made a treaty with our Blackfeet uh, neighbors. And 19 generations back, there was a man named High Fire in the Blackfoot language who took one of my ancestors as his wife. In those days when treaties were made, they exchanged children so that the children of the other could become knowledgeable about the history, the stories, the ceremonies, the songs of their partners. We made treaties with these newcomers and they took our children, but they did not send us theirs. They did not understand the process. And today I hear their children saying, can you teach me? Can we work together? Can we move into the future in a healthier way? And I thank you. I thank you to the ones who had the vision. And I was impressed. I work with scientists at the University of Saskatchewan because we are funded to provide science, literacy, and numeracy. Those are the only things the uh, government will fund us to teach our children. And I did a survey among our schools. I work with 24 schools. I work with 20, 20 or 4,000 students. And I did a sample survey in our schools. What would make you want to come to school in the morning? We would like sports. We would like music. We would like cultural teachings. And I took that to the superintendents and to our directors of education. And they said to me, but we are not funded for those. 
we can't take any of the money and spend it on those things. This is all we can use the money for. And I talked to the principals, and one of the principals said, I have a guitar. At 3.30, when they get out of class, they can come over, and I'll teach the ones who want to learn how to play guitar, play guitar. This is a young First Nations principal. Drummers come in at noon, and they teach the children about the laws of the drum. The drum is alive, the drum is sacred, the drum is your voice in the spirit world. So not only do they learn the songs, but they learn the history and the understanding. Having the culture rebuilt. And I have, we have been able to get some funding to hire elders. And so I am in the process of training elders. How can we work within an institutional environment? The practice has been, they tell us, bring an elder in and we'll give them 50 bucks to come in and talk to the kids or the teachers. If anybody wants to talk to them, they can go and wait in the coffee room. <laughs> Our elders have gone through a lot of coffee waiting. <laughs> And I said, this is not good enough. We have to identify their areas of expertise and their interest. And we have to bring them into the classroom. And we must begin to pay them, not based on their ethnicity, throwing them scraps. But like any professional, if you brought a white professional into this place, would he do it? for the 50 bucks. And I said, what would you think? I'm working on my house. I need some plumbing done. I need some electrical work done. I need some jip rocking. And if I were to put out an ad and say, any white man who has these skills who wants to come and do this work for me, I'll give you 50 bucks a day. <laughs> what kind of reception do you think I would get? We must begin to rethink the rules of engagement. There are no vacuums there. We have processes, we have protocols. We have, and the processes and the protocols are part of building healthy relationships. The relationships in our families, in our communities, in our country, provinces, have created some pretty sick individuals. Individuals who have no caring, who cannot care, who have learned how not to feel, and therefore are in the process of killing their souls. These are sick and dangerous people. And we applaud these people and we elect them to office, and we give them the mantles of authority, and say, lead us, not knowing where they are going to lead us. Today we have the benefit of hindsight, and we can see where they have led us. And today we have the opportunity to look back at where we have been, because where we have been and where we have arrived are going to be indicators of where we're headed. And the one thing that we will be guaranteed of is that we will end up where we are headed. And we must become conscious and begin to make choices. Do we really want to end up there? Or is this the moment that we have been waiting for to reflect, to remember, to reimagine, to dream, and go back and take the other fork in the road we are all responsible. We are all implicated. There is no point in pointing fingers at each other and trying to lay blame on each other's doorstep. But we also have the responsibility 
we, all, we not only share the guilt, but we share the responsibility to renew the dream. And that is the challenge that I laid at the feet of these politicians. That is the challenge that I lay to the Canadian government. That is the challenge that I lay in front of every Canadian. Can you work together? We do not look for advice. We look for people who can listen. Not only with the body, root what they have heard in their minds, and determine if it has the ring of truth because it creates that emotional resonance in the heart that will either nurture your spirit or it will help to pull it down. This is the challenge for all of us. And I ask you, stand up and be counted. We've heard from, from four educators, and each educating according <coughs> to radically different methods and in different forums. But I, but I love that, and I love that the final panel of the day will feature, uh, has featured not only young people themselves, but the role models, teachers, uh, mentors of the young people who will be the face of this conversation for the next 50, 60, 70 years. I, I'm going to seek guidance. Is Emmanuel back there? I know we departed right the uh, schedule some time ago. So <laughs> should, we, um, do you, should we just go to questions? And um, we're running a little bit late. Yeah. We're running. If you could take just one question or two, I really appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> so no one. Statements. No statements. Okay. One yeah. question allowed. <laughs> one question allowed. And, and, and please be respectful <laughs> of the fact that. Some of the panelists uh, need to use the washer. More than one, in fact. <laughs> and hurry up. It's yours. <laughs> Perfect. I'm not asking for money, so don't worry. I'm taking off my cooch hat as well. You know, this whole weekend I've been, I've, I felt inspired by a few things, but I'm honestly more ticked off than I am feeling anything else. I, and I feel so because I think that the discussion is always, one, one quote that's been coming to my head is that, you know, power concedes nothing. They will never give you anything unless you demand it, and you demand it in a way where they, are, where they have to give it to you. They don't give it to you. And I'm like, this is my uni negotiating head talking, so I'm always living in a world of conflict. So maybe it's time for some conflict. I don't know what kind of crisis is gonna create some kind of action from the government, maybe a housing crisis in Atahuasca, maybe a chief sitting there for six weeks on a hunger strike, maybe thousands of women being taken from their homes, maybe tons of people being killed in the streets of Winnipeg. I don't know what kind of crisis is, is, is gonna make them react to anything, but maybe, and this is what we do, you don't, they, people don't act unless you take out their pocketbooks. You look at where they're getting elected, you look at where they're, how they're getting elected, who's funding them, what are the means. Because if a government has a choice between one, either um, making the flow of commerce being perfect and doing nothing for aboriginals, or the flow of commerce and commercialization going slightly inconveniently while doing something for the First Nations peoples, they will always pick number one. They always have and they always will, until you create the crisis and take it over. So I don't know what your thoughts about that are, but um, I would like to see what the eighth fire is going to bring. Uh, 
When we look at the situation as it is, we may make the mistake of thinking that we have some control. We gave up control. And the movements that we are going to be seeing worldwide will often seem to be leaderless. But I say to those who cannot see that they are propelled by the spirits. They are motivated, they are awakened, and they are driven spiritual. And we simply need to have the ability to recognize what is our role in it. And our role cannot come, and our, our gains cannot come at the expect or, uh, or at the expense or abuse of another being. We all win, or we all lose. Could you make it? Yeah. Um, I, I think also it's important, um, uh, it, it's also important for us as individuals who are here, the strategy that we employed at our first Meet Me at the Bell Tower rally, which only had 40 people, that transformed our second rally into having 100 people was saying, everybody here right now, if you are with me, if you are with us, come back next time with one friend. And it worked. And we're still going. But the challenge I have for the folks that are still in the room and listening on the TV, <laughs> sorry, um, is we talk about the importance of, of planning for the long term. That is extremely difficult. I want, to, I want to be more specific in the time frames that we're talking about because we have to put deadlines in place. So unfortunately, um, we cannot control anyone other than ourselves. But I ask for you to control yourself in the next seven days. Seven days from today. What day is it? Sunday? By next Sunday, I see people sitting in podlets Okay, uh, if you came here with somebody else, let's use our relationships with, with one another as, account, as, as, as mechanisms for accountability and follow up with somebody that you came here to the conference with within the next seven days and say, what have you done to improve the relationship on an individual level? Because if we multiply that one individual's decision by two, that's already doubled. And look at how many people we have sitting in this room right now. I don't know what the eighth fire looks like. We all have to decide. And we, and we have to decide through our actions. I've, I've thought a lot about this as well, and I think part of me struggles with it because it's like, what does it take? Like, what's it going to take um, for us to be recognized? What's it going to take for someone to, to empathize with our, with our situation? Is it going to take another Ipper wash? Does that need to happen? Does another person need to die, need to be killed? And no. And, and I feel like going a little bit off of what both um, um, speakers have already said, building relationships, I think, is key. And like was said yesterday about drawing international attention, the more people that we can get to partner and understand and having conversations like this where people are actually understanding and they're getting ticked off. That's good that you're getting ticked off. I know it like sucks to feel that way, but that, like, <laughs> that's good that you're ticked off because then you care. And I know other people are ticked off. Get other people to get t ticked off with you and then turn that into action. Don't let it be, oh, I'm ticked off because I learned about this history and that's awful and that's it. Be ticked off and turn it into action. Teach other people, build relationships, and yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens in the future as well if we continue this conversation. Okay, okay, and you good? So yeah, join me in uh, thanking our panelists. And lunch, lunch. <laughs>